And uh, just a huge thank you to Mark, Graham, James, and Ian. Where's Ian? Ian. Right, they cooked for the men last night. And wow. Yeah. I said to Shirley, it was incredible. And Shirley's response was, lucky wives. It's like, <laughs> pray for Miriam, please. Pray for her. I can't cook. Um, but it was incredible. And it was interesting because Celeste, there's Celeste, he shared, he shared a little bit about his life and a few things, a few thoughts. And, and um, I was talking to, to Celeste afterwards, num- a few things. Number one, I, I always saw myself as maybe a slightly older brother, maybe at best a kind of like a young uncle. But it turns out Celeste sees me as a father. So he was trying to encourage me. <laughs> um, but I was talking to Celeste afterwards, and it was interesting because Celeste's testimony of how Christ has worked in his life was, was quite similar to mine in the, in the sense that without Christ, I have no idea where I would have been. I mean, I became a Christian at 16 years of age, okay? Like prior to that, I was just sharing with Celeste, and I'm not proud of this, but prior to that, I can remember being so blind drunk on the streets of Rill that I was climbing over cars on the streets, taking drugs, and 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 just this is just before I I, I became a Christian, and and I was saying to Celeste, isn't it interesting the scripture that says He will save you from your sins. And we often see that as God forgiving my past, which is true. He, he cleanses from all my misgivings, my failures, my flaws, right? God does that. His blood has done that. He forgives my sin. But what, what, I, what I noticed that when I became a Christian, the transformation was notable and I, and I honestly, I, I, was, was, I don't know if I'd have been, I, if I would have still be alive if I hadn't have become a Christian. <laughs> because such was the chaos in my mind. And it needed, it needed, it's like, you know, in the beginning, it says, in the beginning, God said, let there be. And it was the first start of God creating something. And all we see God doing from that moment on Once he's spoken to the universe, light, which to me is God, a revelation that, hey, guess what? I'm here. It's that kind of, let there be light. I'm here. All God does from that point on is bring order to chaos. And things that were, wherever he created order, he then filled it. What did he do with the seas? He, well, he parted. You're jumping ahead here. We're in Genesis. Genesis 1. You're getting to the good bits. Quick, calm down. Genesis 1. Genesis, what did he do? He, he created the sea and he filled it. He created a sky and he filled it with birds. He created land and he filled it. With animals. Isn't it amazing? And this is God. This is what God does. So I was so encouraged, Celeste, by your, your testimony because it was like reminding me of, you know, how long ago now it was, 36, four, four years ago, 34 years ago, when I, when I said, you know what? It's just a simple prayer. Really simple prayer. I just, I'd heard about Jesus. I remember, I remember going to a meeting, right? I was 40, about 14 years of age. I went to this meeting and this guy was talking, this guy called Ray Bevan. Who remember Ray Bevan? Hey. And this guy, I had no idea. I hadn't got a clue about church, about God, nothing. And I go to this meeting and I, I, all I can tell you is I didn't understand it all, but I knew there's something in this. Because... 
it was like a washing machine inside me. <laughs> what is this? I didn't sleep properly for six weeks. 14 years of age. And then I kind of just, you know, you, you, you kind of learn to push that aside. But all I'd heard about is this person called Jesus. Jesus. And I remember simply praying a prayer. The 20, what, you know, what were you doing on the 21st of Jan- January 1990 at about 10 p.m. at night? Some of you weren't even born. Celeste, were you born? No. Oh, shut up. I was born, I was born, I was you were one. Oh, dear Lord, help me. 1990. Were you born? Yeah, I was eight. So I was born in 1990. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> 21st of January, 1990, 10 p.m. I, I was in my bedroom and I said, I, I just knelt on the floor on my own and I said this prayer, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you died on a cross for me. And I believe you've forgiven me of my sin. I want to live for you. I went to bed. And I got up different. That's all I know. (laughs) That's all I know. I didn't steal anymore. I didn't swear anymore. Not that I want to make a big deal of things like, you know, I'm stealing, yes, but swearing, you met. Listen. But instantly. (laughs) Saves you from your sin. That's Jesus. That's the reality of encountering the person of Jesus. And um, I don't think I'm going to speak long this this morning. Everyone says he says that every week. (laughs) But we've been looking at the life of Gideon, and and, and I just feel like I hadn't planned that introduction, but I feel like it's something that's going to dovetail into this. But we were looking at the life of Gideon over the last, I don't know how long it's been, eight weeks or so. And... uh, I, I just, I don't know about you, but I've been so encouraged looking at this man's life, Gideon, Judges 6, where you find this man who is stuck in a wine press threshing out wheat. Now, you don't do that in a wine press. You do that on a threshing floor. If you do it in a wine press, it's really hard work because there's no air there. You should thresh wheat where there's air so it blows away all the chaff, right? So he's doing, and he's hiding because of, of these enemies that were coming and stealing everything. And so the rest of his mates are hiding in caves. He's doing his best, right? He's just trying his best to, to get by in life, so to speak. And, I, and it kind of like, that so often speaks of so many people in life, right? We're trying our best sometimes just to get through, right? Just anybody ever felt that way? I don't know. And it feels like maybe I'm just threshing wheat in a wine press. That's how it feels. And, and, it's, and it's in that moment that God shows up with the most encouraging thing but confusing thing you could ever hear. God turns up and says, the Lord is with you. No. You can't be with me. <laughs> because if you were with me, I wouldn't be struggling. But... The truth, the truth is God was with him, even in the struggle. And so that's where we find Gideon. That's the starting point of Gideon's journey. Is That's the first mention of him. He's in a, in a wine press, threshing wheat, whatever that looks like. I think it looks like this. It probably doesn't. I don't know why I think, right? That's all we know. And God turns up and says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And that's the truth. So be encouraged this morning, right? If you're in a struggle, or life is a struggle, or life sometimes feels like that, on the premise of this scripture, can I just say that God is interested in your life, and he loves you. 
and he's with you. It reminds me of the scripture, it's in Corinthians where where Paul is talking and he says, God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chooses foolish things. He chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. I was saying to Celeste yesterday, and he was the same. I mean, this is a bright, articulate guy, by the way, Celeste, when you talk to him, right? I was about to say, I'm a bright, no. All I can tell you now, right, I promise you, you, if if my teachers from primary school and high school came and saw me now, they would be gobsmacked. They would be gobsmacked. What? Mark, who was in remedials for everything. They, also, they, called, they nicknamed us the Rems. I didn't mind. It was great. The work was easy. Not a, right off. Could, I was one of those kids that, do you know when you finish school and everybody wants to go back to sixth form? I was one of those kids where they were like going, yeah, sorry, there's no places here. So like, yeah, no, no, there's no places. Oh, am I getting an R off you, Sue? Oh, well, at least Sue loves me. Right? It's just, that, just the truth. Then God gets hold of a life. And that's why I think there's hope for real. That's why I think there's hope for real, because I know, I know when God gets a hold of a life and speaks things, and that person is prepared to listen, because Jesus said that a lot, right? It's not just about hearing, it's about being prepared. It's not just about, you know, knowing it, it's about hearing it and listening to it and being being prepared to live it out. Because if you do, you'll build your life not on sand, but on, on rock. And so when winds come and a storm comes, guess what? You stand (laughs) because your life's built on something else, right? So he can use the weak and the foolish. So when I'm feeling, I don't know about you, when I'm feeling unqualified, which I do every week, (laughs) untrained, inexperienced, uncertain, under-resourced, uninformed, When I feel like that, when I feel like I'm failing, falling, fearful, struggling and striving, when I look at the life of Gideon, I know I'm in good company. And I just go, okay, Lord, I believe you're with me. It's interesting, right, just as a side note, it's really interesting if you read Judges 8, which I'm not going to do. I thought I'd finished Judges last week, by the way, uh, it's just but this story, but I just want to finish one more message this morning. If you read Judges 8, Judges 6 and 7 is this, this Gideon who is displaying this weakness, this vulnerability, this uncertainty, this sense of, I don't know if, if I can make it, constantly needing affirmation from God, constantly needing God to come with, you know, with fleeces and confirm things. And, oh, if you're afraid, go down to the enemy's camp, listen to what they're saying. Because, God, and God's so gracious with that whole journey. But what is interesting is if you read Judges 8, it, it turns around and he makes an effort and people start looking to Gideon instead of God. And they start worshiping the effort instead of God. It happens all the time, which is interesting for me because that tells me something about life. Actually, the, the time in life I'm most vulnerable is actually not when I'm struggling, but when I'm succeeding. I was talking to Roland this week about pride, weren't we, mate? We were talking, just saying, oh, my goodness me, it's so subtle, so easy to, be, to have pride. And it's so subtle, but pride, you know, the Bible says it's a biblical phrase. Pride comes before a, it's a, it's Bible. Let, 
the, the King James says, um, he who stand, take, take heed lest he fall. And so there's a sense of, oh God, you know, there's a, there's a sense of actually it's good when I feel weak. Because that was, the, that was what Gideon had to learn through his whole journey, even with the army. We talked about that last week when he takes 32,000, he reduces them to 300 and says, now you're ready. <laughs> What's that? No, I need more. No, you need less. That's just God. Why? Because um, you'll, think, you'll say you did it. And then you need to know it's nothing to do with you. It's God. Right, so. I love this quote, right? I, um, Tim Keller, right? He's, oh, man, alive, what a guy. He, he passed away recently, actually. He said this, if we knew what God knows, this is so clever. If we knew what God knows, we would ask exactly for what, we, what he gives. It's clever, right? But we just want to avoid struggle. Who wants to avoid struggle? I, I do. I don't want to avoid, I want to avoid, but there's something about struggle that gives you strength. And, and, and that's important. And so there's a guy in the Bible called Jacob. His name's Deceiver. That's his name. Imagine that, Marty. Name your kid Deceiver. Jacob, that's what it means. It's not a cool name, right? <laughs> Not like, not like the Nigerians. We went, um, Baba. Hey, Baba's just had a baby. Give him a... Well, he hasn't. Sorry. <laughs> Adatun had a baby, uh, a, a little baby, Azariah. We went to the naming service on Thursday, and that was awesome. But the, the, the Nigerians, they pick cool names for their kids. Ro where's Roland? Is he here? Where's Roland? Not, not our Roland. You're the Roland. Oh, hi. Roland, you're, he's getting married in August. To a girl called Precious. Promise. I keep getting it the wrong way around. Promise, not Precious. Celeste, stop laughing at me. Right? <laughs> promise. But yeah, Roland's getting married into Promise. So they have the, they're, they're, these are the names. Promise and, you know, strength. And what, Karina, what's her name mean? Peace. See? These Nigerians have got it all together. I'm just called Mark. I haven't got a clue why. <laughs> Middle name's Wayne. I haven't got a clue why. Probably because of John Wayne, I, I'm guessing. Which is all right. I can cope with that. Right? I've got a clue. But Nigerians, they're all cool. Jacob, he's born. Let's call him Deceiver. Wow. Thanks for that, Mum. I don't know. What did they look in his eyes? You oh, shifty eyes, this one. <laughs> call him. But he's called Jacob. There's more to the story if you read it. I'm, I'm, I'm playing around. But actually, there's a moment in Jacob's life where, where actually he meets God. And, and in, in meeting God, guess what? A struggle happens. And he's struggling with God. Guess what, right? God, he's wrestling with God. Who knows God's not going to lose that? This wasn't, about, this wasn't about God going, all right, let's have a wrestling match, see if I can beat you, Jacob. This was about God teaching Jacob something. And in that struggle, Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And so he touched him on the hip. And, and this is the important bit. Guess what he did with his name? He changed it. To him, God strives, God struggles. He who struggles with God, that's now your name. It's called Israel. That's where it started. In a struggle. So who knows your future actually might be a result of the struggle you're in. Guess what? God knows that. He's in charge. So how am I going to conclude this whole thing about Jacob quickly? How, oh, sorry, Gideon's story. We know he started in struggle and we know he went through Many things. How does this story, 3,000 years old, and I'm talking about it here, 3,000 years later, it's three chapters of the Bible out of 1,189. People like that kind of stuff, information. Three chapters. 
How does it apply to me today? We know what happened, but does it really apply to me? I haven't got an Asherah pole in my garden. <laughs> I don't worship Baal. I haven't got Midianites camped outside my garden, right? So I don't know. Does it apply to me? <clears throat> to finish off, I want to go back to where we started. And this is where I started with this scripture about Gideon. Because he's mentioned in Judges 6, but he's also mentioned in the New Testament in Hebrews 11 amongst the hearers of faith. And this is what the writer in Hebrews says, what more shall I say? Time will not allow me to tell of Gideon. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Who, listen, this is important, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging fire, and escaped the edge of the sword, who gained, love this, who gained, how did they, they gained strength from weakness. They gained strength from struggle. How? Through faith. Through faith. They became, so they went, to start with, but they became mighty in battle. How? Through faith. And they put foreign armies to flight. How? Through faith. Through faith. So, I want us to talk a little bit about that. Three, I've got three little points I want to make. And then uh, we'll be finished. Faith. What is faith? A lot could be said about faith. A lot is said about faith. I want to start off with this thought. Faith must be part of a Christian's nature. It must be part of our nature. It must be just like, you know, people can be kind-natured and good-natured. Faith must be part of our nature. It's in, it, for believers, it's in, it, the clue is in the title. We're believers. So faith is part of our nature. This, and, and that encourages me, right? The Bible says that faith is a gift from God. Ephesians 2. It says it's a gift from God. It says the just shall live by faith. The Hebrews, the, the book we, we've just read from that talks about Gideon, the reason the writer is writing to them is because they are wavering in their faith because of struggle. There's that word again. They were struggling. I'm struggling. So, so that they were wavering in their faith. They wanted to they wanted to possibly return back to Judaism. Go back, let's go back. It's easier to go back. Sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes forward seems hard, so let's go back. But God always calls us forward. And to go forward, you're going to need faith. faith. Right. So, I think, I think so. faith should be part of our nature. Another thing I think about faith, which is really, really important, is... From the Bible, I think we conclude it is fundamental, right? Like wheels to a car. But, but imagine Henry Ford sitting down and saying to the guys, right, we're going to build a car. We need these things called wheels. They're very, very important. Let me explain what wheels are. They're round, right? And, it, and we're going to put rubber on them, and they're going to carry the weight, and, da, 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 and they explain everything about wheels. Guess what, right? You're never going to get anywhere unless you make the jolly things and put them on. Faith is more than just fundamental to Christianity. It's functional. Does that make sense? And I, and, I, and I think sometimes we can talk a lot about faith. We can preach about faith. How many messages do you think there have ever been over time about faith? Millions of messages about faith, right? Right. Because it's, it's, it's clearly important in the Bible. 
but it's important that I understand that it's actually more functional than, than just a theory. It's something that I have to apply into my life, okay? Jesus said, with, that, with faith, all things are possible. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without it, it's impossible to please God. And Jesus said in Mark, have faith in God, or have the faith of God, which is an interesting, which is actually a better translation. Ephesians says, faith is a gift from God. Hebrews says, it's the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things unseen. Romans says, whatever is not a faith is sin. Corinthians says, we walk by faith and not by sight. James says, what we do is evidence of what we believe. By faith. Jude, we need to build up ourselves up in our holy faith. Galatians says we're justified by faith and that the Holy Spirit promise is moves amongst us by faith. That's what Galatians says. Colossians says we are encouraged, well, encourages us to continue in our faith. Thessalonians talks about work produced by faith. 1 John says this is the victory which has overcome out the world, our faith. I would conclude from that list that faith is pretty important to us. So what is it? What is it? It's indispensable. It's important. I remember uh, when you go on holiday, we were going on holiday recently, and um, I don't panic too much about packing, or as I've got older, I have. Is that something that's going to happen to me as I get older? I've started to get a bit more fastidious about it. But I used to think, care. It's like, do you know what? I've got a pair of swimming shorts. Passport, swim shorts, passport, tickets, toothbrush. Oh, okay. <laughs> toothbrush. Right. And I'll be there. I'm good to go. The rest, guess what? I can buy. I still, I still used to think. But you're constantly checking for passports, right? Constantly checking. So when we were, when we were driving, to the, to, uh, uh, before I left the house, I, I have the responsibility of the passports. Do you have the responsibility of passports, Luke? Do you? Wow, I'm amazed. <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm winding you up. I'm just think, I just thought Danielle would like to be, know, it all, know everything was in the right place, you see. So Miriam gives me the responsibility. So I'm like, so I got the responsibility. <clears throat> And I'm like, before I leave the house, I'm like, right, count them. One, two, three, four. Right. Miriam, how many passports? I'm getting, anybody like this? Right. I count them. So, okay. Right. I'm putting them up. I'm put, right. You're watching me now. I'm putting them in this bag. <laughs> Have you ever done this? No. Or is it just me being weird? All right. I thought you were all like this. No. So I'm like, I'm putting them in. And I carry the bag with me. And I get in the car. And just as we get, this is true, just as we go around the corner, can somebody just check they're in that bag, <laughs> please? Because you can't get very far without it. You don't want to get to the airport and you haven't got your passport. But guess what? If you haven't got a spare pair of undies, you're going to be fine. As long as you, do you know what I'm saying? You're all right, aren't you? You can get on with it. Do you know what I mean? But your passport's really important. So that's, that was that. And faith is like that. Faith is that important to the Christian life. You, you, it, it, we have to build ourselves up in faith. We have to be, attend to our faith. We have to learn how to continue in our faith. We won't get through life as a Christian and get through the struggles of life and be the people that God, become the person that God wants you to be, which, by the way, is the most awesome person on planet Earth. I'm not, I'm, 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 God has created us in his image. You tell me that's not awesome. And God just wants the best for us. He wants me to become the best version of me. And so he uses struggles to do that. But we, how do we get through it? We get through it by faith. So I was thinking about this. So three things I'm going to talk about. That faith is, it's, it's, it's understand, we've got to understand that faith is step by step, not a finish line. If I get time, because I'm, I, I, if I, the next point will be we're going to we're going to look at faith. Is how do you how do you have faith? Well, faith is believing. Believing, that's what faith is, right? Believing is looking at because Hebrews said, "Look unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith." And Jesus made it clear that believing, uh, looking to us, is believing, right? So we'll talk about that, and then the final one. 
is faith, understanding our source. That's what I want to, the three things. Let's see how far we get before we all get too hot and start falling asleep. Um, okay. <coughs> Historically, when I've thought about faith, and remember, this is how Gideon achieved things in life, right? His faith. Historically, when I thought about faith and hearing messages about faith, I, I would have this conclusion that faith is about believing a promise, taking God at his word, hold the Bible to be true, and then stepping on it. He would, he would say, yeah, that's pretty much a definition of faith, right? And then, you know, you would say that, and then you'd give examples, and test, we call them testimonies, examples of you know, I went through this and I had faith and God did this and I had a financial miracle and healing and all that stuff's good, by the way, right? So we'd go through that, answered prayers, usually practical or physical like health, finance, protection, success in business. And these would be examples of faith, right? Because we would believe in God and his promises and, and all that stuff. I totally get all that. But then I read Hebrews 11:34 which is a continuation of the list. Because it says that they were mighty in battle. They became mighty in battle. They overcame this. They did all that. But it also says this. The same people who, who were full of faith, this is what these people did. They quenched the raging fire and escaped the edge of the sword. Don't like this. They, they, women received... Uh, back their dead, raised to life again. Others were, now this, this is the bit I'm not sure about. Others were tortured. What, by faith? Others were tortured and refused their release so that they may gain a better resurrection. Still others endured mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, oppressed, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and hid in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet they did not receive what was promised. Hold on a minute. Faith is believing a promise, taking God at his word, holding the Bible to the and start stepping on it, and then seeing that promise. That's faith. Well, it is. But it appears to me that the faith that Hebrews is talking about is a bit deeper than that. When I look at the life of Gideon, let me ask you a question then. Which bit was faith? Which part of the story is faith? The bit when he's in the wine press? I think he was struggling. Was that faith? That didn't look like it, but was that faith when he was struggling? No, well, that can't be faith. The testimony of faith is when you come out of it. Right. right. But the Bible says there that they were commended for the faith. What the people who were destitute, oppressed, mistreated, they were struggling. Wow. Interesting. I'm just going on a using the scriptures to go on a, a journey to understand faith. So was that the bit, was, he, was it faith when he offered his sacrifice and God took it, when well, he took it, he offered God a meal and God took it as a sacrifice. Was that faith? Was it when he went and did the thing to his father, tore down the Baal, uh, the, the Asherah poles and destroyed the altar? And was that faith? Was it when he beat the, I'm sure the point I'm making is this, right? It was all faith. It was all faith. Faith is step by step. We were, we were uh, in, uh, on holiday in Greece, and we went to this place. Miriam wanted to go to this place called the Seven Springs. And uh, she's not here. I think it was called the Seven Springs. I was like, I was driving. So if you drive abroad, it's pretty stressful because you're driving on the, on, on the other side of the road, plus in Greece, and if there's any Greeks among us, and um, right, the people on bikes are completely bonkers. Right, because they come, they overtake you this side, they overtake you that side, and they don't wear helmets, and they're just all over the place. So it's like, oh. so 
Um, Miriam goes, let's go. So, okay, we go this place, and it was down this country lane and up this big mountain, and we eventually got to this seven springs. And when we got, we, we were like, okay, park up. Where are the springs? And this guy says, oh, you can go over the road here to the springs, or you can go through this tunnel, but it's pitch black. And you just keep, go- you just keep going. Just go- I-, I meant to get the video. I've got a video of it. I should have got the video and put it up for you. You just keep going. Jessica was in the tunnel with us. And uh, wasn't it this American guy? Huh? The American guy said, he told us about the tunnel, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The water. So you're walking through this tunnel, right? And, it's, and it, you, if, it, you're poof, banging your head every couple of steps. So you're like this. It lasted five minutes. Pitch black. Walking through this tunnel. And as you go through halfway, you're just thinking... Did anybody check that guy knows what he's talking about? (laughs) Like, we've just met this random bloke who's clearly not Greek and gone, yeah, go in that tunnel there. It gets you where you need to go. So we're just, by faith, you get my point, in darkness, just just keep keep going. And it's pitch black. And the water was freezing, which actually was quite refreshing because it's roasting hot. But we just kept walking. Kept walking, kept walking, bang in your head and keep walking and keep walking, bang in your head and keep walking. And all of a sudden, you see a light. And you come out, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So you come out of the tunnel. And it just occurred to me, like, is that an example of faith? I think it is. I think it is an example of faith. It's, it's step by step, the Bible says, we've read it, we walk by faith and not by sight. It's not a measure of how I feel, my circumstances or what I see. It's not an end goal. It's a journey. It's a walk. So when God appears to Gideon in the struggle and says, hey, I'm with you, it, that's why it's confusing to him. Because he's like, no, 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 if you were with us, we wouldn't be struggling. No, the Lord is with you. I'm, I'm learning a song at the moment called Highlands. And I'm going to plan to do it in a couple of weeks. And there's a line in the song, right, that's got a hold of me. It says this. You're no less God in the shadows. You're no less God in the shadows. Bible verse. Somebody give me a Bible verse for that. Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It's not about mountains, it's not about valleys. It's about him being with you. Every step. No less God within the shadows. I love that. So we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith. If if I have just that definition of faith, you know, it's about the promises and all that stuff, and it's just in that form alone, I kind of have a idea of faith that it's all, it, it, it's kind of just about me getting stuff. Does that make sense? It's, it's just, but it, it, that's not faith. That's not the life of faith that Hebrews is talking about. It's talking about trusting him, right? Luke quotes this all the time, and I love it because it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Proverbs 3, verses 4 to 5. What is it, mate? Trust with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. Faith. Faith. So, faith is step by step. Faith is looking unto Jesus. Listen to this, right? This is, this is a Bible definition of faith. We, we, we can have lots of definitions of faith, and, and like I said, there's been millions, millions of sermons on faith. But actually, the Bible just has one definition, and it just appears in, in, in Hebrews. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's just so simple. 
not complicated. And so we get to the writer in Hebrews explaining what this might look like. And he says this in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witness, so he's talking about Gideon and these guys, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set out for us, looking unto Jesus, the author. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. It's too hot. We're going to finish another time. I've got more to say, but we're going to finish. It's just hot. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, uh, listen. It, it, yeah, let's pray. Luke, can you just play for a minute for me? You've all been amazing. Hope you've been encouraged this morning. I don't know where you're at in life. I have no idea. I, d I don't know. Lots of people probably have no idea where Gideon was. Anyone see Gideon? not in the cave it was definitely not in the threshing floor because he's hiding we're all hiding from the enemy where's Gideon where is he right he's in oh he's threshing out wheat in the wine press the thing of faith I want you to grasp this morning by faith I want you to grasp this no matter where you're at in life no matter where you're at in this journey the the writer in Hebrews talks about being a race set out for us. Wherever you're at in that journey, wherever you're going through, and for a lot of us, right, it possibly feels like a struggle. I want you to grasp this simple, simple truth this morning. That what the story of Gideon tells us is this, that, that whilst Gideon was struggling and he thought he was on his own, he wasn't. He's, the God came and said, the Lord is with you. By faith, I want you to grasp this morning that he's here right now. I can sense his presence. Sense it in my spirit and in my heart. I can just sense it. to try and get God's attention you've got it what you need to do is realize by faith that he is interested in the every bit of your life and he is with you in the struggle in the striving with your mouth he who believes in Corinthians it says I have believed therefore I have spoken there has to be something that comes out of your mouth to confirm what you believe it's important you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved that's the Bible 
God's not messing with you. He's not messing. And the reason I know that is because of the cross. Because of the cross. simple prayer Jesus I believe in you I believe you are who you said you are I believe you're the way the truth the life I believe that no one comes to the father no one comes to the father of life no one comes to the source of life unless they come through you I believe I'm broken I know I'm broken I can sense the anger sometimes. I can sense that sometimes even things like jealousy, even things like that come up inside me. And I know I'm broken, but God, I thank you that you, even though you see that, even though you see that, you still can come. <laughs> come, let me, let me clean you. Let me wash you. Let me change you. Let me be to you the strength you need. Because you don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to do it on your own. By faith, these people gain strength from weakness. Gideon gained strength from weakness by faith in God. Put your faith in him today. I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you died on a cross for my sin. I confess it is my sin. And I thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I thank you that now I'm called a son and daughter of the living God, that my life is in the hands of another. I choose heaven. I choose heaven.